Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning as we're gathered to worship our Lord Jesus. Uh, it's really good to see many new faces. It's good to have students back in town, so welcome. Uh, we're having a picnic this afternoon at 5 p.m., so be outside. It's a picnic potluck. If anyone would like to join us, you're more than welcome to come back this evening at 5. We'll be right here on the lawn. I guess we'll have food back here in the pavilion. So that's this afternoon, and we'll be beginning to announce things about our home groups and other opportunities that will begin, begin here in the fall. So everyone's welcome to come this evening. Also, next Sunday, Danielle and I are going to host students for a brunch after church. So if you're a student and that's pretty liberal with that description, uh, you can join us after church for brunch at our house. There'll be more details about that. Um, after church, please hang around for a little bit and let's just all gather out back. There's lots of great room at the playground, the pavilion. So after the benediction, we'll just try to all head out to the back and hang out for as long as you like. We'd love to meet some new folks. Um, this beautiful day, I, I hope by then that the fog will burn off and we'll be able to see the beautiful sky. It was a beautiful day yesterday, wasn't it? All right, there's just a lot to rejoice in. The Lord's kindness. But I'm also well aware there's, if you're listening to the news at all, this is a hard week. Right? Lots of sorrow around the world, whether it's Haiti or Afghanistan, or maybe there's something going on in your personal life that you're bringing sorrows. So I'm just struck by the fact that we come to the Lord with both, right? We bring Him our joys and our sorrows. We'll sing and give Him thanks. And we'll bring him our burdens and laments. Uh, he wants it all. We want him to be the center of our life. So as I've been thinking about our life together, what, what brings us here together? Certainly it's not our politics. It's not because we all have the same sports team. It's not because we live in the same exact town and go to the same schools. Right? None of these sort of temporal, fleshly things are what, what gather us. We gather for one reason. That's the holy kindness of God in Jesus Christ. And so I would point out to you our call to worship, which we're going to say together in just a few moments. It begins with, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That's why we're gathered this morning. Because the Lord's Mercy is over all that he has made. And so I welcome you this morning. I hope that you have a sense that the Lord is kind as he speaks to us, as he gives us the gift of singing, as we bear one another up in prayer. Come as you are and receive the Lord's kindness, and hopefully we can extend that same mercy and kindness to one another as we're changed by his spirit. So welcome. We're going to begin singing. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Would you stand? And we're going to call one another to worship using God's words from Psalm 145. Let's read together. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. Let's sing to him.
Let us pray. Oh, merciful Father, thank you for calling us here today. As, as your word reminds us, if, if we do not sing out, then the, these rocks will cry out, and we want to rejoice with all of your creation. Uh, be with us now as we study your word, as we pray for each other, and um, and learn from your word. Uh, and just be with us now. May our may our worship be uh, be pleasing in your sight. And in your son's name, we pray. Amen. 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 Let us sing. Uh, come down. Now. We're going to read a psalm that calls us to praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. It's a Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes judgment, or who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are, bow who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. 
Praise the Lord. We now come to our time of confession, um, where we can each go to the Lord and confess what's going on in our hearts. It's a good time just to reflect on your week or um, your attitudes this morning as you're coming to church. And it can be a time of struggle trying to get everybody here. Um, but let's just take a, a few moments to quietly go before the Lord, and then we'll, we'll read our confession together from the Lord. Us together. O Lord Christ, we live in a world at war. You are the only one who can provide peace. We live in a broken world. You are the only one who can provide wholeness. We are a sinful people. You are the only one who can provide pardon. We confess that we are full of good intentions, but we can keep in promises. Our only hope of doing God's will is that your Spirit helps us do it. Lord Jesus, Word made flesh, our world waits for your peace, for your healing, for your pardon, and for your grace. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. To hear God's declaration of our forgiveness from Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Let's continue to worship. Let us stand. We're going to sing his mercy.
Our confession of faith this morning comes from the Children's Catechism. I'm going to ask three questions. You guys can respond in the bowl. This is the first question Who made you? God. What else did God make? All things. Why did God make you and all things? For his own glory. And so as we step into a time of prayer, this simple confession of faith calls us to remember, to be reminded of the things that God has made. Right? And so we can take some time to thank God, the one, the creator, the one who has made those things, for the things he has made that glorify him. Right? It's a children's catechism so we can think about our kids Think about the fact that we're gathered together in community and friendship. Uh, like John said, that you guys are killing it with the scene this morning. Think about song, art. These are things that good things that we can thank God for now as we pray. And uh, in, a, in a crowd this size, there are some of you who are feeling the effects of what we confessed in our confession of sin. That yes, God has made all things and yet they're broken. And we feel the pangs of that brokenness. And so this time of prayer is a time for us to lift up one another, to point one another back the one who created all things. That is our hope, right? Uh, and so if you're new, there's got a lot of new faces out there right now. This is what we do at Providence. We're small enough that we pray for one another, right? So we take some time, we share, uh, and then we actually pray for uh, one another aloud. And so I'm going to open the floor. If you're, again, if you're visiting or new, I should introduce myself. I'm Jimmy. Um, there are some prayers to guide us in the bulletin. Uh, we're praying for campus ministries. We'll be praying for Hope Prez up in Jose. And certainly the church in Afghanistan. And so at this point, I'll open the floor. If you guys have something that you'd like to praise God, the one who's created all things, or you're lamenting and feeling the brokenness of the world, I invite you to share either or both. Get up. So I have um, two things. One is, um, you know, it was particularly sweet when I was uh, traveling this summer to spend time with my sister and to also visit my old church in Maine and to see family there uh, that God has placed me in and then to spend time with my friends in college. This is the 24th summer that we spent together and the tie that truly binds us is not the best university in Alabama, Auburn but instead it is uh, Christ uh, in us and through us that makes us family uh, and then I have a prayer request my boss, Amanda had a horse riding accident and she broke several ribs and has a concussion and this is a particularly busy time at the university, so I'm sure you can call me yes. And uh, I understand both of those injuries take a long time to recover. So just prayer for her and for those who will be picking up the slack for her. Thanks, sure. Others? Yeah, my dad, John, is uh, struggling with COVID. And... Uh, we also have our niece who got COVID. She doesn't have any symptoms to say that yet. And then Robin, I guess it's brother, we'll just say brother in law, um, wants to move. So I guess our family, there's just a lot of people struggling with COVID right now. So that they would come through and entrust their lives to the Lord. Yeah, thanks, John. We're glad Others. Yes. My sister is still pregnant. Wow. <laughs> yep. So uh, she's being induced this evening. So we could pray that that goes well. I know she would appreciate it. Any others? Ethan moved in to uh, school at George Mason University, which is up in the D.C. area, um, this past week. Um, he's doing great. Uh, I actually even talked to him this morning. He is at church this morning. We found a church, um, New Hope Prez, right close to his um, close to his dorm. So just prayers for him that he will um, 
you know, when he's in that area, that um, you know, there'll be a lot of temptation, but he will be able to uh, stay true to his course. And uh, and prayers for me because I miss him a whole bunch. Joseph wanted me to share that he has a cut on his leg that is getting healed up, and he's thankful that he's doing it. Great, others. Yes? I, I know Brian mentioned it earlier, but prayers for the people of Haiti. Um, I, I don't know how much more one country can handle than quite, you know, place of a couple months in there. Where we are being killed in an earthquake and then now a tropical storm on top of that. Um, and just, just to make it small, there's a, there's a, a boys' school, uh, a Christian boys' school there that, um, well, their carceral raider drugs, um, and it's supposed to help uh, boys in trying to keep them out of gang violence. And uh, I know it's hard because the football season's starting that they keep them down there. So I just pray for that school as well. Others? All the praise. Um, so we've been praying for my, uh, I guess I can call my cousin Joseph. Um, he was moved to a neuro unit and his wife wasn't able to be with him and um, he was ending up at a point where he needed some extra supervision and so God made a way where there wasn't a way and she is in there with him now, which is a blessing and he's been making some steps towards progress. So um, this is after having a tumor removed from his brain. He's just making very slow steps of progress, but praise the Lord. Any others? Quickly, I'll mention also uh, what Mrs. Lincoln was saying. She's pray for family and friends. If you find yourself uh, in our church without a friend, you should know that the leaders, myself, John, Brian, Riz, literally part of our job description is being a friend for homeless. If you find yourself without a friend, come find me. I feel like I'm approachable. If you were a woman, my wife is in the back. She would love to be a friend. Uh, and I say that completely seriously because the world is a mess, it's all upside down, it's easy to not have friends. I'm 36, and sometimes I'm like, do I have any friends? I get it. Come find a friend. We want to be your friend. We're called to be your friend, right? And students, we're pumped you're here. Um, we're going to be praying for you, and if you find Providence to be your home, we are so excited. But we're going to be praying that you get settled wherever that may be um, in a church that loves the Lord and preaches the gospel. We're going to go now and pray. We've got a lot of things to pray for. If you would. Um, pray with and for one another uh, briefly, and, and then we'll conclude and, and, and go into the, the sermon. But pray with me now. Father God, we rejoice at hearing the voices of little ones. Uh, it is a blessing to have kids, God. Uh, thank you that we can be at church. Who uh, it sometimes feels like he's literally bursting at the wall for kids. I praise to you for that blessing and that gift. Um, Lord, you are the king of all creation. You created all things with the intention of pointing to your glory. Why? Because you're so good. Because you're eternal. Because you're everlasting. And so, Lord, we come this morning um, in different places. Some of us having just started a new chapter of our lives in town, at college. Um, some of us having left our kids at college for the first time, uh, or on the precipice of doing that. Some of us just starting a new school year, coming back from a uh, summer of um, traveling or vacation. God, I pray that this morning you would quiet our hearts, that you would help us to be where our feet are, which is here in your house, worshiping with your people. And so God, there's lots in our hearts, things to celebrate, um, things to pray for earnestly. And so now I pray by your spirit, God, that you would hear your prayers with me.
Now I pray for the students as they are returning to school. I know that a lot of them uh, are excited to get started again, um, but some are also concerned about their future um, and they're anxious. And I pray for Lord for the um, believers that are on campus, the students, the staff, the faculty, the um, ministry that work on campus. Because uh, we have a hope that we can provide um, to help us to be salt and light, help us to smell like Jesus, help us to make them hungry for you, um, help us to give away the hope that you have put in our hearts, uh, not because of how the world is going right now, but instead knowing that you are in control and that we know the end of the story that you always win. Lord, we pray for Sam, that you would bring healing to his vocal cords, and we pray that you would have mercy uh, in this upcoming surgery, that it would be successful, and that Sam would be able to praise you with a strong voice. Oh, we lift on Sister Katie to you. Trust in your perfect timing. We pray that you would keep her and her baby well through her induction this evening uh, and I would entrust them into your hands. Thank you for bringing Ethan safely to George Mason, for providing a way for him to continue his education. And I pray that he would walk with you in every sense of that idea, that he would center his life, his studies, his um, thoughts around you, Lord, and that you would bless him and keep him. Pray for uh, we give thanks for the work you're continuing to do uh, in Robert's cousin Joseph, and thanks for making a way where there was none. And thanks that every little increment of blessing um, that you bestowed on them, they turn back to you in, in gratitude um, and praise and glory. God, would that be the pattern of our lives? That every small or big blessing we would see as a, a gift from your hands. Uh, thanks too for sharing. Thanks for keeping her safe this whole summer and for um, the perspective you've given her to look back on a life of um, years of communities and friendships and bonds with sisters, friends, uh, churches, uh, classmates, and that it's 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 beautiful. That it's it's bound by um, a hope and a trust in your son, and it is from your good hand. Um, thanks that she can rejoice in that. That I pray that you would. Prepare her for another school year and um, bless the work she's developed with students over her right now. Gotta pray for John's family and for others who are struggling with COVID. Um, uh, Lord, would you deliver them quickly? Would you spare them from um, deep complications? Uh, would you grant them patience uh, and rest uh, as they do? And Lord, I echo the prayers of Eric uh, for Haiti. Um, and God, I expand them even more. Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and China, 
all these places, guys, really the world, Lord, would you frustrate evil, would you restrain it, would you bless and, um, uh, the work of your church, would you multiply peace and hope uh, where it seems like there should be none, would you guard the church and defend it, and God, uh, seeing it now, Lord, you are strengthening the people of both of these countries, leaving that against you, God, um, in the face of death, that, um, your church is clinging to what they believe, God, if I pray that that would be true of us. If you ever call us to that, God, that we believe and cling to you with that same fervency and, and hope, and the same hope of faith. Um, God, now I pray for the preaching of the word, God, would you change and transform our hearts um, for our good and, and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Normally we would do an offertory, we haven't done that in a while, so if you have offering, there's a box in the back, but we all do stand and sing the doxology. So if you would, please stand and sing with us now. books of the Bible, and we're in, towards the end of Matthew's Gospel, the last week of Jesus' life, and really his last really extended teaching time discourse here. We're going to pick up in chapter 23, where Jesus begins speaking to the crowd and his disciples. I'll read verses 1 through 12. This is the God's word for us this morning. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. They make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, it's only by your Spirit that we can quiet and humble ourselves before your Word. It's only by the gift of faith that we can believe these things and walk in these things and trust that if we do humble ourselves, that you will one day will exalt us. If not in this life, the next. So, Lord, would you just break up the hard ground of our hearts, pierce through the masks and the superficiality, Lord, that we might not be counted among those who are considered Pharisees, but that we would be your children disciples of our Lord Jesus, walking after him by faith. Lord, we need your spirit. Open your word. Come in power. Change us, I pray, in Jesus' great name. Amen. I have on my book a 
shelf, the biography of a, of a little known Canadian pastor who died in 1992 before many of you were even born. And this pastor struggled many years in French speaking churches up around Quebec and Canada. He never wrote a book, he never had a blog, he never had much influence in, in his denomination. By all accounts, he was an ordinary, very ordinary pastor who never felt like he'd done enough. His name was Tom Carson, husband of Marge Carson, who died before him with Alzheimer's and took care of her in his last years. I wouldn't know anything about this man. You, none of us would know anything about this man were it not for his son, Don Carson. His son, who wrote this little book, this little biography about his dad, Don Carson, maybe a few of you know, a lot of guys like me know about him, because he's a seminary professor, a prolific author, co-founder with Tim Heller of the Gospel Coalition, well-respected, one of the most trusted Bible scholars of the last 40 years. In one of his books, Don wrote of his parents, of his dad Tom and his mom Marge, he wrote this, but with great gratitude to God, I testify that my parents were not hypocrites. That is the worst possible heritage to leave with children. High spiritual pretensions and low performance. My parents were the opposite. Few pretensions and disciplined. I read that quote many years ago and it's really struck with me and sobers me and causes me to examine myself. Where am I pretentious? And am I really walking with the Lord in a way that will be a blessing, not just to my kids, but to my church, to my friends? Pretensions versus performance. Superficiality versus substance. Jesus warns of the one and values the other. Jesus describes the Pharisees have been verbally sparring back and forth. The people have been around listening and watching, taking it all in. Jesus himself, who we know is not much to look at. Jesus was physically ordinary. He had very few possessions, little if any money. He had a group, small group of friends around him who were this motley band of fishermen and scoundrels. But there's something extraordinary about Jesus and his words. As he speaks to his disciples and crowds gathered around to teach them in the hearing of the Pharisees about things that really matter. When Jesus speaks, he talks about things that really matter, about the values of God's kingdom. And so here in verse 23, this is going to begin, if you have a red letter Bible, there's a lot of red. <laughs> we're going to look at the first 12 verses where he begins with a series of warnings about using the scribes and the Pharisees as sort of a negative example. He begins with a warning to beware hypocrisy. Look at verse 3, or verse 2. Jesus said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. Hypocrisy. Do not imitate them. Their lives don't match up with the law that they teach. Now there's an interesting note here. I want you to notice. Jesus, Jesus acknowledges the Pharisees' position, their role. They sit on Moses' seat. They are earnest, moral men, ex very serious about expounding God's law. And the people need that. God's people need to hear God's law taught. And frankly, apart from Jesus, this is the only place they're going to get it at this time. Jesus actually shares with the Pharisees a reverence for the law. He shares their understanding of its nature and of its authority the problem is their practice of it falls short. Their interpretation, their application is the problem. 
So don't misunderstand. Jesus doesn't have a problem with the law they teach, with God's word. In fact, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a little eye, not a dot, not the, the dot of an eye in the law will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not trying to relax God's law. He just wants to see it interpreted and applied and lived out properly. And these Pharisees aren't doing it. They're teaching it, but they're not practicing it. So he's saying, listen to what they say as far as they're teaching God's word. In fact, conform all of your life to the teaching of God's word. Hear the word and do the word. <laughs> but not like these guys. Not like these guys. They claim their pride in their position, but they don't live it out with sincerity. They take great pride, but they sit on Moses' seat. Basically, they're teachers in the synagogue, teaching the law of Moses, and they, they take great pride in that. But they're not like Moses at all. What Moses did as he spoke God's word, he was freeing people from their oppressors, right? He was freeing them from idolatry. He was confronting the powers of the world. But these Pharisees we read in verse 4 are only adding burdens. The Pharisees and the scribes are more like the Egyptian taskmasters than the prophets of God's kindness. Now, the Pharisees and scribes don't know the grace of God. They don't know a life of repentance and faith. They preach the law, but they don't know anything of the spiritual power that God supplies for obeying the law. They don't have a heart relationship with God that we desperately need to have any hope of keeping God's will, right? There's an old English poem that goes like this. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far greater news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. They're preaching law, law, law without any grace, without speaking of God's kindness, without first talking about who God is, the God of the Exodus, the God who provides water where there is no water, the God who always comes and meets his people when they cry out to him, the God of mercy and loving kindness instead. They're just piling up rule after rule after rule and smothering God's people. Run, run, run without helping them. When God's grace comes to us, it gives us wings to fly as a free people. Now Jesus values or warns us of hypocrisy and he values sincerity. The practice of the law that is by faith. That is coming from a place of dependence. Jesus values the sincerity in us that we would say we are weak and needy people. We can never keep the law of Jesus. We're not with us. We would have no chance of rightly keeping the God's law if we don't humble ourselves before it. Cry out to him. Seek the help of the Spirit. If we don't have brothers and sisters encouraging us, we would be so entangled in sin and selfishness, we would be undone. No matter what seat we're sitting on, what position we have, what title we have, what part we have in campus ministry, no matter what our grades are, or how long we've been a member of the church, or how many generations back our parents have been, whatever, all these things don't matter if we're not living a life of faith and dependence on God's grace. Oh, beware of hypocrisy. Follow God sincerely in a life of dependence and faith and repentance. Jesus goes on and he warns us. He says, beware the merciless. He talks about in verse 4 how the Pharisees and scribes lack mercy. They tie up heavy burdens. 
hard to bear. They lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them even with a finger. They won't even move a finger. They have no mercy. God's word, rightly understood, fulfilled by Jesus, is ultimately liberating, freeing, redeeming. Paul would preach a, a long sermon in Antioch. It's recorded in the book of Acts. He, Paul preached, let it be known that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him, everyone who believes is free. Free from everything that you could not be free from by the law of Moses. The law of Moses can tell you what to do, but it can't free you from the fact you can't keep it, from its guilt and shame, its burdens. For that, we need the gospel. We need Jesus. We need God's grace. Where there is grace, where Jesus is, there is freedom and liberation and redemption. Moses himself was looking forward to this. He talked about a prophet that would come that would be greater than him. <laughs> Moses was looking for Jesus. And so he rejoiced, right, when he gathered with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was pumped up to encourage Jesus and hear how it was going. The Pharisees have been content to serve themselves instead of serving God's people to exalt their own self-righteousness, even at the expense of burdening others. <clears throat> you know, I've been trying to think, how, how do we do this these days? I mean, we're not, you know, if you read further in the chapter, they're doing things like tithing mint and dill, like they're, they're guarding their herbs, the Pharisees are like measuring out a tenth of the herbs that are growing out their, their pot out back. All these little details are just a burden to the people, but well, how do we do this? I think there's just a spirit to it. One way we do it is maybe you make your, your particular strength the marker of true godliness. Like whatever you, maybe you're, you enjoy prayer or, or, or Bible study or serving or evangelism or whatever it is that you sort of think that, you know, you're doing pretty good with the Lord. That's your strength. Well, Pharisee, what they would do is they would take their strength and they would make that the number one marker of, of holiness and then congratulate themselves on how well they're doing. <laughs> like there's this impulse where we try to find things about ourselves that are good and then we elevate that. Well, that that's, that's the important thing. I always try to examine myself with these things before I try to come at you. I was thinking about my prayer life. You know, where am I on the pretension to performance scale in prayer? Because quite frankly, I have a lot more time to pray. Like it's part, I can justify praying for eight hours a day. My job, I can do that if I believe, really believe in this power. I talk a lot about prayer. I encourage people to pray. I, I read a lot of books about prayer. I buy and give away a lot of books about prayer. I emphasize its importance. I teach about it. But what if I'm not actually praying at all? Which sadly is true for a certain, has been true, certain seasons in my life, certain days of the week, forgetful, especially. It's a terrible hypocrisy. And so if I'm not willing to lift a finger and to come alongside and pray with people and to pray for people, what am I doing in all this talking about prayer? I, I trust the Spirit will help us to see these places where maybe we're, we're burdening others with the way we're living out our Christian life without a willingness to really enter in and help other people, to come alongside and be humble and sympathetic. Jesus values sympathy. Jesus, by his spirit, will work into us hearts that are sympathetic for those who are weak and struggling and maybe don't seem like they've come quite as far along in the walk as we have. 
Jesus doesn't burden. He unburdens. His hand is heavy upon us until, if we won't repent, his hand will be heavy upon us, but when we repent, when we turn our eyes to him, he would free us. In his own words, Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, burdened, same word, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Our ministries, our lives, we are in the business of unburdening those around us who are, who are burdened by the weight of their sin and the lies of this world. The expectations of others, people pleasing, terrible burden. The anxieties were, that are forced upon us that you have to succeed and make and do well in school and get that job and, and, and find a spouse and live this life that's the envy of others. All these pressures coming at us from, from the world and even within the church and Jesus would unburden us. He's deeply, deeply sympathetic with us as we want to make our way through this world of a certain rest time. Beware of the merciless. Jesus values sympathy and kindness. Lastly, Jesus would have us beware show-offs. That's what the Pharisees are, verse 5. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. They're showing off. They, they're people pleasers. They want to be seen by others, and they think that they're better. <laughs> they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. I know none of us have phylacteries a little leather pouches that would hold pieces of scripture. They would tie them on their arms or their head. The fringes on their cloak were meant to remind them of God's promises, remind them to pray. And these weren't bad in themselves. Jesus had fringes on his cloak. We know because the woman took hold of that fringe and was healed. But the Pharisees would make their fringes longer than anyone else. Their phylacteries broader as an outward physical way of sort of flaunting what they thought was their greater holiness and godliness. They love the best seats and the best titles. And it's just anything that says, check me out. See what I'm doing. Notice how hard I'm working. Notice how much I'm giving up. Notice all these places I'm serving. Anything they could do to sort of show their position in their local campus ministry, in their, in their neighborhood. I was talking to Joel about this earlier this week, how you could contract the Pharisees, contrast the Pharisees with John the Baptist, who was totally different. Here they are, sort of dressing with their clothes to look holy. John the Baptist wore camel hair and a leather belt. Here they are, the best seats in the synagogue and in the marketplace. John the Baptist out in the wilderness. Right here they are, saying, look at me, look at me, what I'm doing. John the Baptist saying, look at him, behold the Lamb. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. How are we doing this? Where's the inner Pharisee? Where's the, the humble brag? That's where I think the chance is. You know about the humble brag where you sort of, man, I'm tired from getting up at 6 a.m. These past 20 days to have this devotion and pray. I'm tired. Right. Can you pray for me? <laughs> right, I, mean, I don't know how you do it. I think we find these subtle ways to give signals and ways that we think are righteous to flaunt our self righteousness. I've caught myself being quick to say how many years I've been in ministry, especially when I'm gathered with peers. For some reason, it just comes up, yep, and up on 13 years now. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I'm accumulating righteousness every year that God keeps me on my feet. The only thing that gives that time value is Jesus and what he's done. Why would I brag about that? Jesus values humility. He wants to entrust us. He wants us to entrust ourselves to him, to live by faith doing the unseen things that God calls us to do and then wait on him. 
and really believe we're safe in his hands, if no one ever notices your effort, if no one ever notices your prayer life, if no one ever notices the way you serve your roommate, if no one ever notices the way you're giving yourself away to the, the poor and the needy, if no one ever notices anything you do for Christ, that's okay. Because God, you will be exalted, verse 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. He doesn't say it'll be in this life. He doesn't say anyone else will know this. But in his kingdom economy, one day, even if it's in glory, you will be exalted. Verse 12 is written in what's called a theological passive. It has nothing to... God will do it. It just will happen. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. God will do it. We are driven for recognition. Do you see that in yourself? In our flesh, just as our people in this sinful world, we are absolutely driven by this drive, this need for recognition. I think it's the way we're made. The problem is we distort it and we try to get it from others. When we really need it from God, we need to trust ourselves to Him. So this year, as you're beginning a new school year, will you strive and anxiously toil to get recognition from others, your peers, your professors, your parents? Or will you live by faith? and wait for the Lord to exalt you. Remember, Jesus wasn't exalted until after he died a publicly humiliating and shameful death. And we're not promised anything more than what he did to him. So what's the key difference? Let me close. What's the key difference between a Pharisee and a disciple? Between pretension and performance? I would argue it's simply this, centering Jesus in your life. All this business in verse 8, 9, and 10, you're not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher. You're all brothers. Call no man your father for you have one father who's in heaven. Neither be called instructors, instructors or teachers for you have one, that is, the Christ. No person can be the measure of godliness. That's what he's saying here. He's not saying, you can't take this too literally. Like, you haven't sinned if you call your earthly father, father. What he's saying is, we are all equal, brothers and sisters. We have one ultimate father to glorify. We have one ultimate teacher to follow, the Lord Christ. He's saying, we're all down here on level ground. The ground is level at the cross. The Pharisees and the scribes were putting themselves at one level and the people at the other. There was this hierarchy based on external appearances. Don't do that. Don't, let's not do that in our church. Let's not do that in our ministry. Some kind of hierarchy somehow. The ground is level at the cross. We have one instructor, a teacher, the Lord Christ. We have one Heavenly Father, God, that we're all glorifying together. You'll be a whole person, sincere and sympathetic and humble. When you realize we're all the same in this together, seeking to listen to one voice, we have one Savior, one hope, one person to follow in the way that He walked, to follow Him in the life of service. Verse 12, verse 11. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Because Jesus was a servant. Who put the towel on his waist and washed the disciples' feet. Who took our burdens, our ultimate burdens, on himself when he carried that cross out of Jerusalem to the place that they call the place of the skull, the place for outcasts, the place for lepers, and hung in our place, taking our guilt upon himself, 
to raise us up. The holy and compassionate eye of Jesus pierces through all of our masks, all of our pretensions. Jesus sees our hearts. We got to deal with him on this. So I'd encourage you make this this Sunday, make this afternoon and this week a time for dealing honestly with Jesus from the heart. I began by talking about Tom Carson, Donnie Tom Carson. I'll, I'll close with that. I'm going to read from the very end of a memoir where Don talks about the death of his father. He wrote, when he died, there were no crowds outside the hospital, no editorial comments in the papers, no announcements on television, no mention in parliament, no attention paid by the nation, only the quiet hiss of oxygen, vainly venting because he had stopped breathing and he would never need it again. But on the other side, all the trumpets sounded. Dad won entrance to the only throne room that matters, not because he was a good man, not because he was a great man, he was, after all, a most ordinary pastor, but because he was a forgiven man. And he heard the voice of him who longed to hear, whom he longed to hear, saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. At the last day, in the final analysis, the only thing that matters is if you know yourself to be forgiven. If you know the holy kindness of God that is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter if you get that diploma. It doesn't matter if your life looks a certain way. It doesn't matter if you ever win that championship. It doesn't matter if you please anyone else. What matters is have you dealt with God? Have you found His mercy and kindness in our beautiful Savior? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? And then we'll sing to him. Oh Lord Jesus, you know us inside now. You know the worst thing every one of us has ever done. And yet the invitation still stands to come into your mercy and kindness, to know your gentleness and your forgiveness. If we would but Turn from ourselves, our posturing, our pretension, our striving, our self-righteousness, our self-trust. If we would but turn from that and embrace you at the cross. And trust ourselves into your nail-pierced hands. Venture all on you. So Lord, would you free us this morning? Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you draw us further? into the hope we have in the gospel. And Lord, would you bless us now as we sing together of your kindness that you will lead us. Make us your faithful followers. It's in your great name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
everyone's invited to come back this evening. Potluck picnic out on the lawn at 5 p.m. And now I would invite you, we're going to gather right out these back doors under the pavilion on the playground. Please stay and meet someone. Uh, I'd love to meet you. Go now with this benediction. And now may he who is himself our peace, our Lord Jesus, be your peace. Go in him.